Hey, what's happening, everybody? And welcome back to Storytime with Julian. This is episode number 94. We are just six episodes away from our 100th episode. And at episode 100, we're going to take a little bit of a chill and we're going to come back to you with a little bit of a different format and some really, really wonderful changes. I'm excited about the continued growth and development of Storytime with Julian, but I'm more excited about the fact that those of you who have been here with us from the first episode have been able to watch and and see it grow, develop, and change. And and uh, it just thrills me. I'm not even going to front. It, it, I'm excited for what it means for this show and for me, but I'm also excited because I get to share this experience with you. Now, I know that uh, since over a year ago, when we first did this back in uh, March 24th of 2020, like right smack dab, in the in the in the beginning of the throes of the pandemic we had some people who have been loyal faithful watchers since episode one and i know we have some lapsed folk too now those of you who have been here for a long time know some of the names and and the folks that we used to see all the time that we don't see around no more i want to encourage you if you remember and it's it's easy to fall out of the habit listen i don't take it personally but i understand life be life in Life be life and you be in the middle of you got a nice little rhythm going and then something happens and it throws off your groove and, you know, oh, I'll get to it next time. Oh, I'll check it in next week. And then the thing that used to be the thing that you always do kind of turns into, oh, man, I forgot I used to do that. If you know somebody who falls under the category of the lapse, maybe give them a little reminder right now. Here's what you could do. If you were so inclined, here's what you can do. You could share if you're on if you're watching this. On Facebook, you could share this directly onto your page so that the people who like you could be cool. They could see what you like. What, what, what's she watching? What are you watching on that side? Now, if you're watching it on YouTube like you're supposed to be, you can go ahead and you can copy the link to this channel. You can post that in your social media places. You can make sure that the people who you know would love to hear some good black lit read by one of the best to ever do it. That's me. I'm one of the best to ever do it. You could go ahead and make sure that they have an opportunity to enjoy what you enjoy by sharing what I share with you. Go ahead and copy and paste that link to your social media. Take a minute to do it now. Take another minute and invite somebody that you have not invited Oh, shoot. I did get the no I got the numbering wrong. So I've got to go back and change it. That's right. This is episode number 95. We are five episodes down. Ah, oh, wow. 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 I had to give it the full Owen Wilson. Wow. Anyway, check it out. This is what we can do. This is what you can do to help us build. Now, I also want to encourage you while we're talking about making sure that you subscribe on YouTube and like. I know that some of you all are a little bit confused because I tell you, hey, we got a grab bag. It's going to have some amazing books in it. Some of them are autographed. It's going to be at least it's it's legit a at right now, currently, the current value of it is at least three hundred dollars. I know that. Now, the the now not that you're gonna resell the books. It's books. I love books. It's to hold on to and read and enjoy. But I told you, you gotta like, subscribe, and you gotta make sure that you comment on the episode. And I think that most of you are commenting in the chat thread, thinking that's what the comment in the episode means. Uh -uh. No. I need you to comment on the actual episode itself, like on the on the actual channel part, not the thing on the side, but in the actual channel comments. I need you to comment this thing on the side that y'all doing. That's the chat. That's fine. You can chat all day. But what's going to be read for the for the contest, for the giveaway of the story time with Julian lit bag is going to be the comments. Those are what count as entries. Incidentally, speaking of entries, Latricia Ransom was the only person who was not an admin or affiliated with Storytown directly to complete the task. And so she has won the copy of Dark Matter Reading the Bones. That's going to be mailed out to her at the top of next week. So everybody give it up to Latricia Ransom. She was our winner. And Lock Dreamer just asked what happened to the giveaway. So that's what happened to the giveaway. I went through, un unless I missed something, I saw Latricia. I didn't see nobody else tag Storytime in a comment about the uh, uh in a comment about the stories from the from the last two weeks so to be clear i see some questions going on let me get uh, to erica's question so we need to watch the video after it goes live to comment in the video right that is correct 
Yes, B. Benny in the house says, I think so, Erica. Yes, that is correct. Now, let me make sure that I am greeting everybody that's here. I saw the L Jack was here. That's the Lock Dreamer in full effect. Who else we got? We got Angel Monique, Melanie Monroe. We got Erica Goodman. Lou Homie. That's Homie Lou. She's back. She done chefing. She back to listen with us. That's what's up. We've got Neptia 07. Who else do we have here? I saw some other names. Kelly Ruff, old friend of mine from back in the day, is here again. I love it when we see you come through. Angela Rains, always there, loyal and faithful. Judy Lee, same, always good to see you. We see Kamisha Umstead is in the building. I was wondering, I didn't see that little hand wave at the top of the stream. I was like, maybe she's not coming today. And we already said that we uh, that we have Latricia here as Olive and Boo, and Kitty Foxy is here. And uh, let's see, who else did I say? Who else did I see? Miss Ebony Martin is in the place and Benny B is in the house. And that's what's up. That's what's up. That's what we got. And I encourage you, each of you, invite a friend, invite a few friends. Go ahead and tag somebody. If you're on Facebook, make sure you tag somebody. If you're watching the Facebook stream, make sure you tag somebody. If you're not and you can't tag anybody, that's okay. But please, please, please go ahead and share this link on your page. What's happening, Sean Macklin? I saw you slide through. Now, enough of that. I'm not going to beg you for your participation. You're here and I'm glad. And because you're here and I'm glad, I feel like it's a good time to read a story, don't you? What are we going to read from tonight? Uh, When we came back from hiatus, we sort of pulled from random two books. We pulled Dark Matter Reading the Bones, which we have been loving. We have been all so far everything that we have pulled from that book has been a hit i'm excited about it but we also read from this book black from the future now black from the future you may recall is an anthology it is a collection of black speculative writing it is edited by two black women uh writers and it is a collection of black women's writing and uh really really excited about this the first story that we read from this now this also includes to be clear it's not just stories it also includes some poetry so when we first read from this we had a little bit of poetry going on and we had a little bit of uh of a wonderful short story called caramel 1864 by jewel gomez and uh i know that spoke to a lot of y'all some of you big fans of vampires really enjoyed that go ahead check that out if you didn't get a chance to see it was that a spoiler a little bit is it going to ruin the experience of the story for you not at all not at all fantastically beautifully written story um a lot of wonderful beats a lot of wonderful intimacy a lot of wonderful historical reference without it being uh too traumatic i really really think you're going to get into it i don't know why benny b is talking about tag team and your friends it makes me uncomfortable um (laughs) But anyway, moving right along. So what are we reading tonight? Tonight, I did another quick skim. I looked at a couple of titles. I looked at length. I didn't even do uh, the normal like two page skim through. I found two stories that just intrigued me based purely on the title and the premise alone. The first one is really, really short. It's called Miss Beulah's Braiding and Life Change Salon by Eden Royce. And to be perfectly honest with you, I don't see any reason to go through a whole lot more preamble. Let's just get into it. Let's get into it right now. And listen, as we're doing the reading, I do want to see your comments in your chat, like the way that you the way that you respond and react to it. That matters to me. That matters. It really helps me understand um, what some of your tastes and your preferences are and uh, the way that you enjoy stories helps me to shape how I present them on the show. So don't think that you that the chat is just sort of a side feature. It is of critical importance to the cultivation and development of the program. All right. That being said, Miss Beulah's Braiding and Life Change Salon. feel like there's a glasses off kind of story, right? The chime above my door shop, the chime above my shop door rings. It heralds a young woman wearing a head wrap, boasting a network of silvery constellations on indigo, interspersed with the occasional yellow gold moon. The wrap itself is made of silk, not the finest grade, mind you, but sufficient to conceal what she must see as a fault. None of her hair is visible, but the contorted celestial bodies show the fabric is at the end of its tether. Her gaze flicks around, lighting on every little thing in the salon, then leaping away to the next. From the incense cone on the windowsill, emitting apple and lily-scented curls of smoke, to the crisp white sailcloth curtains snapping sharp in front of the open window, 
then to the merry fine merry fire burning in the iron stove across from me that consumes all it is fed without giving off heat. Finally, her weary, heavy little eyes settle on me. I do not get up. We Jin do not like to move much, especially while in our solid forms. But I smile and the motion to styling chair in the front of me. She stares at me for a short while, and while she does, I can hear her mind clicking like some clockwork toy, trying to make sense of what she sees. Her eyes get wider as they take me in, lightening the dark rings under them for a moment. But she doesn't run. She doesn't scream. A good sign for a first-time client. After a deep breath, she walks in with bird-like steps from the front door, across the gleaming tiles, and sits in my chair. She removes her head wrap with care, releasing her hair from its prison before folding the cloth into thirds and picking at a stray thread. Her gaze stays firmly in her lap. And I know her struggle. This poor thing takes a lot of time to try and keep this head of hair, but it resists her most valiant efforts. Every strand, every coil is a blessing and a curse. Each lock must be cared for tenderly, not touched by brush, but eased apart with the wide teeth of an oil-soaked wooden comb and the caress of pomade-laced fingers, searching out each tangle and coaxing it free. What you getting today? While I have an idea what she wants, I always ask. New clients tend to be nervous and get more wary when I seem to know too much. And even I am not right all of the time. I lost my job, Miss Beulah. Her voice is a whisper of shame and her head tries to dip lower, but I lift it gently with my fingers under her chin. That ain't always a bad thing, you know, doll. I can never remember all their names. Don't even ask anymore. I used to try, thinking it made them feel better, but I realize they don't much care what I call them. I know how to do their hair. I know how to design their dreams. And that is enough. She chokes back sobs, swallows hard before speaking. I can't make it without a job. And it's not just me. I have a son. You want it back or you want another job? Any soul can see that isn't her real trouble. Her pain is larger, deeper, born of powerlessness and fear. It is a pain that doesn't leave even in the midst of sleep what little of it she is getting lately. Sad to say if the return of her job is all she can ask for, then that is all I can give her. I am bound by the laws of my people as much as she is by hers. She takes a while to think about this. And I run my fingers over and through her hair, massaging her scalp and her neck and shoulders until she slumps back in my chair. Whatever you think is best, she sighs. Her hair, a coarse, dusty brown, is dry and thinning. But her scalp is clean, free of dandruff and residue. She did what I asked and washed her hair before she came. The sharp scents of peppermint and sulfur cling to it, and I wrinkle my nose. As my fingers tumble through her tresses, I see she had worked hard at that job, tried to be what they wanted, but she had been fighting a losing battle. They had other plans from the start, and she was filling a space until they found the one they really wanted. But I also see the reason for her appointment. While I work the tangles from her coils, I smooth her hair back from her high forehead, it barely touches her chin. Her ends are even, clipped neat. You cut it? It comes out sharp, an accusation, and she responds as such. The, the other woman who was doing my hair said it needed a trim. Her voice is defensive, a shield against further hurt. Split raggedy ends and all. <laughs> Split raggedy ends and all. Even some of the videos online say to get your ends trimmed to help it grow. Glad she can't see my mouth as it twists. I return the soothing tone to my voice. And it worked for you? No, not really. Well, you here now. I turn the swivel chair to the mirror. Gonna be all right. 
Her eyes hold nervousness, flickers of fear, and a fragile hope. Under my fingers, her scalp feels feverish, damp. I smile to reassure her. You need to choose, I say. If you keep this style, you get your job back, but no more. And I will go back to like, and all will go back to like before. That what you want? Ask me, child. That is the only way to get what you truly want. A little of it anyway. She trembles under my stroking fingers. No, she murmurs, only just louder than the crackle of fire. Soon I see tears on her cheeks, her neck. I feel their heat as they tumble, slide, drip from her chin onto the fabric cape I fastened around her neck. Then what? I speak soft, tender, like to a fearful creature. And that she is. You told me what happened to you. Not what you want. She heaves the words through thickened breathing. I want. Deep gulfs of incense laced air. Finally, she speaks again. I don't want her to go. Not yet. I just need. She swallows. Picks at the faded violet varnish on her thumbnail. A little more time. Her watery brown eyes meet all of mine in the mirror for a moment. Then she becomes more interested in the stitching on her decent enough pocketbook. With your ma, I prompt. Yes, ma'am. Just till Travis grows up. I look at her face. Narrow, determined chin, old soul eyes open wide. Her tremors ebb away until she is only listing slightly from side to side in the chair, rocking herself to a calm. Okay, I tell her, rat tail comb in one hand, wide tooth comb in another. Let us make a change. In another pair of hands, I take a jar of fluffy cream my own blend, rich with seed oils and honey from bees drunk on shea tree pollen. While I open the jar, I pat her shoulder. You look nervous, child. We are the only ones in the shop. I never book more than any one client at a time, even though I have multiples of everything. Chairs, shampoo bowls, arms, hands. I've never had a... Well, you know. She doesn't meet my eyes in the mirror this time, and I suppress my chuckle. <laughs> no, suppose not. I appreciate her sensitivity in not calling me a genie, a captor's term. I am the only genery female de gin in the southeast with a beauty shop. For all I know, maybe even the entire country. Since the law freeing us was passed, many hide, especially those of us who look different but I have chosen not to. What was once taken, my wishes, I now sell for my benefit and for theirs. With care, I part a section of her hair and clip the rest of it away while I apply my scented balm to her strands. They soak the nourishment up and plump from their drink, bend easily. I twist, then braid, winding it into a rope-like plait. Want a magazine? two, three sections at a time, part, apply, braid, pin, now that she has voiced her desires. She tries to shake her head, but my fingers tighten against her scalp and she winces. No, I want to watch you work. I work on her for two hours, twisting and molding her hair into something new, spirals and constellations on indigo. Once or twice, she almost falls asleep, but her forward movement wakes her. Each time there is a second of fear in her eyes when she sees me looming over her, six hands moving like the dervishes throughout her hair and scalp. I'm not offended. The third time I ease her head back onto the neck rest of my chair and sleep spirits her away. She snores softly with a light wheeze. Trilling music sounds, muffled, distant. She stirs, sits up, fumbles in her bag, puts a phone into her ear. I pretend to only hear one side of the conversation. 
This is Tina. Yes. She is? Oh, thank God. No, no, I'll be there. Thank you. Bye. My work on her hair is finished before she replaces the phone. Good news. Tina nods. Our gaze is locked again and she gives me a hesitant, shaky smile. It is a start. All done. I pat her shoulder. Finally, she sees, really sees, her crown of glory. Oh my God. She breathes the words as she touches her once dusty hair, now darkened with moisture and healed with oil, with reverent fingers. The braids and twists glisten where they lay in intricate patterns against her fine head. This, this doesn't even look like me. She shoves the scarf into her pocketbook. Like it. I recap the jar of balm, remove the crisp puffs of shed hair from both combs, and throw them into the fire that constantly burns in my shop. I, I love it. Tina pauses, clutches the bag to her chest. Have, have you taken your payment? I have. Thank you. Yes, I have eaten her nightmares. They were denser, richer than most I have tasted. Ones where she was being chased, where she was falling unceasingly, screaming into an indifferent night where deep with salty, meaty flavor. The one where she was drowning, sweet and light as foam. After only a small portion, I was replete. She nods and gets up from my chair. Anxious sweat has dampened her skirt until it clings to the backs of her thighs. She tugs it free. I guess I'm all set then. Yes. Tina chews her lip, then stops as if she'd had a lifetime of scolding about the habit. How long will this last? I take pity on her and answer the question not asked. If your ma starts feeling poorly again, make an appointment. My eyes narrow at her, five slits of sharp focus to ensure she is listening, but you cannot wear this style forever. A time will come when you must accept that. At the door, she pauses, turns to look at me straight in the face this time with no dread or panic. What do I say if someone asks me about my hair, about you? I am so full. My eyes grow heavy. I let them all close one by one by one by one. You tell them Miss Beulah does your hair. The chime above the door rings, letting me know she has left. I reach over and flip the switch that locks the front door. I have time for a nap before my next client. Time to weave my own dreams. I yawn. Plenty of time. And thus endeth the story. You all have just heard Miss Beulah's Braiding and Life Change Salon by Eden Royce. And that was a delightful little, little morsel of a story, wasn't it? I enjoyed it. Personally, I really liked it. I am finding that there is some real delight to be had in these stories that draw on uh, the old religions and the old beliefs and some of the ancestral beliefs and, and, and some of the, the fey folk of, of our various brown cultures, whether they come from uh, Central and West Africa or various parts of the Caribbean or even parts of uh, the lower Mediterranean or uh, the, the, the upper parts of Northern Africa. There's just some really interesting, um, beautiful characterization to be brought out. And it, it makes for such fascinating storytelling when they are blended with what we know. And I think many of you are finding and discovering that there is a lot of what we never thought about or what we didn't think we knew interwoven and laced in what we have always known. I think some of you are starting to see patterns and figures and characters and understandings pop up and show up in places that you didn't 
expect seeing Legba show up in the South side of Chicago in a story like the one that we read the other week. It's that kind of thing. So I, I'm really digging this. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. What are some of your comments? I want to see what we got here. Oh, see, y'all didn't do a whole lot of talking. That's that's okay. Let's see what you got, though. Um, Erica likes this part about designing their dreams. I did, too. I, I enjoyed that, designing their dreams and then consuming their nightmares as payment. Um, not necessarily a new thought, but interesting the way that it was woven in and, and laced into the story. You know, a lot of you don't know this because you've only ever seen me as this uh, beautiful milk dud that is before you tonight. But some years ago, not so very long ago, I used to have locks. Uh, they came to about here. They were lush and beautiful and wonderful. And during my time in Brooklyn, they were at their healthiest and most nourished. Um, and I had a loctician who was also an Oshun. And every time she did my locks, every time she blessed my locks, it was a transcendent experience. The part where you fight sleep, there's so much more to it, I think, than just the, the natural comfort of fingers massaging your scalp. There is, I, I would feel energy being drawn from me and transferred through and to me when she put her hands in my hair and on my scalp. And um, similarly, I learned to be very, very careful in particular about who I let touch my hair. I could literally feel in a number of the relationships that I was in, I could feel the changes in our relationship through the behavior and the texture and the changes in my hair. It was in Colorado where I had to cut my locks off. And it wasn't until, um, it wasn't until I had them retwisted. I grew them back, retwisted for a while, got to a healthy enough link to part with them in a healthy way because cutting them in Colorado was trauma, but I had to release them a different way. Anyway, that's just a little bit of a personal side note for myself. Um, you can find this book that we're reading from tonight, Black from the Future, at our good friends Harriet's Bookshop. Uh, for those of you all who've been with us for a while, you already know the deal. You already know how to get to them. Uh, so if you are digging on this book, I strongly suggest that you uh, take the opportunity to go ahead and get it. Uh, Melanie Monroe like that line, I let my eyes close one by one by one by one. Uh, Benny was with it. She dug, she dug the story, said that was great. Look at that smile. Look at that smile there. That is a happy person. That makes me happy. TKM052 liked it, and that makes me happy. Judy Lee loved it. Emo enjoyed. Olive and Boo said, I like that. I ain't got no hair, but I really like black salon images. Yo, me too. I'm not going to front. It took me back. It took me back. I used to go to a spot called Tendrils uh, back in Brooklyn that felt a lot like uh, felt a lot like the way that she set this up. And then there was another spot that I went to that uh, I wish... In my 20s and 30s, I operated with the wisdom and understanding that I have now because I realized that I crossed paths with some very interesting people who could see me, but I couldn't see them. Anyway, um, y'all ready for the next story? I, I feel like I am. Let's go ahead and switch up the banner for a minute. This is going to be our next story. I'm just going to go ahead and let y'all get used to it. So I'm enjoying this Black from the Future book. I've So far, I've enjoyed all the books that we've been pulling. I'm looking forward to getting into it. Now, I'm enjoying these anthologies and collections because short story format is what Storytime with Julian was built around. However, um, we got a couple of novels that I am dying to dig into. And so we're going to be pulling excerpts from novels. I want to kind of broaden what it is that I'm able to introduce you all to. I should... Oh, turned away from the microphone and then you can't hear me. I should let you know that in uh, some of the future episodes, we're going to be doing shorter reads um, and they're going to be pre-recorded so that you can have a little bit of bite sized something to kind of chew on and gnaw on. Ultimately, after the 100th episode, what my what my current plan is, and we'll see what I'm able to do in terms of executing. But the current plan is that Tuesdays will uh, will release content 
on the YouTube channel. Thursdays will be the night for the live read. So there'll be, there'll still be content on both Tuesdays and Thursdays, but uh, we won't do live reads twice a week. I want to try and create more snackable, tradable content. Uh, Right now, the reality is this experience is what it is for those of you who are here. And I don't want to sacrifice that and give that away, but it is difficult to ask people who are experiencing or stumbling upon us for the first time when they see the video and they're like, oh, it's an hour and 30 minute commitment on YouTube. I don't do that. And that's fair. That's fair. So we're going to create some more uh, smaller content. And I need as that smaller content rolls out, please, ma'am, please, sir. I need y'all to share it, share it, share it, share it. Uh, but let's keep the party going with the next story. I want to see there's a couple of new comments here. Um, wow. Wow. I. Everybody reading this is having the same reaction, so I don't need to say anything. Everybody who read that had the same reaction. I know everybody who read that had the same reaction because, mm -mm, you know what, just breathe. Pillow stuffing. This story, he said, moving on. This story is called The Eye of Heaven. It's by Nicole D. Scaniers. I'm going to tell you, I picked this story immediately once I saw that the page count would probably work based on this first line. So let's dig in. Before the explosion at the melanin factory, Before sunlight became lethal to our skin and drove the girls in my town indoors, Sandy walked up and down the streets, murmuring to herself. I never knew where she went. Our town was less than four square miles, so she couldn't go far. We'd watch her back as she drifted past our row house, past the Masonic Lodge on the corner where men wore tall felt hats and spoke in guarded tones, past a field where boys played kickball in the summer until she was a blur. Sandy was about 25 then. Her smile, wide and sunny, was sane. Her hazel eyes were not. She kept her hair trimmed in a jagged fro. You could see where she, or or someone, tried to tamp down those uneven tufts into some semblance of uniformity. In the winter, she wore velour sweatsuits, one beige, the other maroon. During summer, her muscular legs were clad in short shorts. After hours of roaming around in the sun, her skin grew very brown. Sandy never bothered anyone, so when people sat outside on their stoops chatting with their neighbors or playing their radio and that lone figure floated by muttering in a language familiar only to her, they just nodded a greeting and kept on gossiping or listening to music. We tolerated her madness. A kindred alien. I later learned that my eccentric neighbor was once a bright girl on a track scholarship to Villanova. Since not many girls from my town attended college, much less on a scholarship, that was quite a feat, one that unfortunately didn't last. According to local lore, when Sandy was 21, enjoying her first legal drink at Vic's, the the one bar in town, someone slipped her a Mickey. Those sweet college days and track and field dreams dissolved with every sip. The night of the explosion, Sandy didn't come home. The streetlights winked on around six o'clock as the days grew shorter. By nightfall, Sandy usually made her way back to the tiny house she shared with her older brother and father, but that night was different. I was in my junior year and I was studying for my SATs at the dining room table. Every now and then, I glanced up at the bay window in the living room that provided an unfettered view of our street. I wasn't sure what I was looking for, are waiting for. It must have been her. Mother was walk- working at the phone company, her second job, and wasn't due back home for several hours. My brother Raymond, two years older than I, was out hanging out with his friends. It was just a normal night in Wing, Pennsylvania. Nothing prophetic or ominous about the setting sun. But then a key turned in the lock, and my mother opened the front door, shaken. Big fire at the melanin factory, 
she said, removing her coat as she came in the door. Ash dotted her hair and smoke lingered on her clothes. They sent us home early. Fair Industries was a bottling plant about three miles from our house on the north side of town, across the railroad tracks. The company manufactured Youth Sap, an anti-aging potion that came in innocuous oyster-colored jars. The commercials featured smiling white women with creaseless skin and frozen eyes. Even if she could have afforded it, my mother never used that skin care system. She didn't need to. She was 41 then, and strangers were still mistaking her for me and Raymond's older sister. Black don't crack, we said with a knowing smirk that praised the seemingly ageless quality of our dark skin, impervious to wrinkles. After the blast, we learned that black not only cracks, it blisters and hurts. Are you okay? I asked, hugging my mother. The phone company where she worked was located in a strip mall adjacent to the factory. I'll be fine, she said. The tremor in her voice belied the words. Never seen anything like that before. The sky was all red, blood red, glass everywhere. It'll be on the news tonight. Later, we watched the news in our bed, our feet touching beneath the blanket. A grim reporter stood across the street from the burned-out husk of the factory and informed us that more than 80 people were presumed dead and another 40 or so had been hospitalized. Who knew beauty products could be so potent? As if reading my thoughts, Mom said, What the hell are they putting in those little jars? That night, my mother started coughing <coughs> and tried hacking noise that kept her up until dawn. The next day, she stayed home from her main job at R&R, &R, a textile mill where she washed and dyed fabric. I worried about her working so much. I read that mill workers face a greater risk for asbestos exposure than cancer from the, and cancer from the fibers used to produce the fabrics. That occupational hazard was a trivial thing compared to what we became in the aftermath of the factory blast. I stayed home that day as well, listless. Propped up in my bed by the window, I tried to concentrate on my SAT practice questions. Sunlight felt heavy on my skin, like a fiery burden. I scooted to the shade at the foot of my bed. Sandy hadn't made her daily trek down the block. Noon was marked by the absence of her familiar stride past my window. Feeling hot and lonely, I walked down the hallway and climbed in bed with my mother. Raymond prepared tomato soup for us when he returned home from school and brought the steaming bowls to Mother's bedroom on a TV tray. He hadn't seemed worn out like we were. I envied his strength. Once inseparable when we were younger, Raymond and I were at that age where we barely tolerated each other. One thing we had in common was our dark brown skin, the color of maple tree bark after a heavy rain, the same complexion as our father, long dead. Did you see Sandy? I asked as he cleared away our dishes. Wasn't looking for her. My brother was always surly when he had to do anything for anyone besides himself. I hope she's okay, I said. Mom had already started snoring. I nestled closer to her. Her unstraightened hair scratched my cheek. Raymond smirked. Was she ever okay, Anuma? You know she ain't right in the head. His insult irritated me, but I was too worn out to argue. In my mind, Sandy wasn't pitiful. She was brave, like some shipless mariner navigating the endless waves of ennui that daily crashed against the shores of our town. To what new lands had those long, muscular legs taken her, or had her brain completely snapped at last and left her stranded in some uncharted place? By the end of the week, my symptoms had worsened. When I stepped outside to get some air or to retrieve the newspaper from the bushes, the sun was a torch searing my arms, my face. My eyes stung. As I hurried back up the front steps, my hand paused on the screen door. It was four o'clock, but the street was quiet. My older neighbors weren't hanging wash on the clotheslines in their yard. No arthritic fingers tended to the chrysanthemums in tiny gardens. No girls played double dutch or practiced their drill steps in the street, clapping, bending, turning with military precision. 
I went inside. Although it was the last day of September and the mornings had grown brisk, true fall hadn't set in yet. Still, I wore gloves and a scarf when I returned to school to protect myself from the sun. The bus ride to Wing High was torture. I pulled my arms all the way inside my jacket and drew the hood over my head. Yet, my skin still burned. Even though I didn't have any close friends to discuss my mysterious illness with, I noticed that Deidre and Lisa and the other girls from my block looked as sickly as I did. These were the girls who called me double-handed when we jumped double dutch and said I threw off their rhythm. These were the girls who shunned me in the cafeteria at lunchtime and never invited me to sit next to them on the bleachers at football games. Now, we moved through the halls between classes, languid, still tucked into our fall jackets, like sisters of an abusive mother, hiding our scars. By the end of the second week, mother broke down and drove us both to the doctor. I'd never been to a clinic before. I rarely had a runny nose, which was a blessing to a single mom holding down two jobs. Sickness meant days off from work that she could barely afford. Twisting in the stiff blue chair in the waiting room of the clinic, I leaned against my mother's shoulder, feeling the heat from her skin through the thin through her thin house dress. Her reddish-brown complexion that always reminded me of fallen acorns was dull. Lines had formed beneath her eyes and across her forehead. The woman whom people always mistook for my older sister looked haggard. As we waited for our number to be called, I scanned the room, which smelled of sweat and eucalyptus. Several of the people waiting to be seen were my classmates and their mothers or aunts or grandmothers. Those skin tones which spanned the dusky rainbow from rose brown to plum black all seemed to be draining of color. It felt as if we were in a segregated waiting room, for coloreds only, as if some Jim Crow virus had descended on our town, leaving us weak and sun-bruised. As I toyed with the drawstring of my jacket, a blue windbreaker that used to belong to Raymond, I turned to the television mounted above the reception area. The news program cut to a commercial break and a familiar jingle filled the room. Youth Sap. I knew that commercial by heart. A smiling blonde with impossibly tight skin smiled as she held aloft a benign porcelain bottle. A dramatic narrator intoned, Say goodbye to crow's feet and age spots with Youth Sap. Our special melanin-enhanced formula gives you a radiant sun-kissed glow in just ten weeks. Uncover your true complexion today. As the commercial faded to black, my mind drifted to the night of the fire. Two weeks had passed since my mother walked in our front door with soot in her hair. The fire was still being investigated, but initial reports blamed the blast on some type of compound in a new formula bottled at the plant. Who knew melanin was an accelerant? I was 16 then, nearly 17, and studying chemistry. I knew melanin was a pow powerful polymer protecting our skin and eyes against high temperatures and biochemical threats. A coveted pigment. But what happened if melanin became toxic, somehow poisoning the darker skins it was designed to protect? That question plagued me as autumn wore on. I could no longer sleep in my bedroom, which faced the east side of the street, gazing into the baleful eye of morning. Even though I hid beneath my blanket when I went to bed, I slept fitfully. Sometimes my arm or cheek would be left uncovered during the night, and I awakened to blisters cropping up on my skin like mushrooms. Mother fared much worse. In a month's time, she had aged ten years. New wrinkles formed on her skin daily, it seemed. We abandoned our bedrooms and hunkered down on a worn sectional in the basement. Raymond's surliness turned to shock as he watched us deteriorate. Yet, he never came down with the flu that affected mother and me and so many other women. Our sun sickness grew so bad that my brother had to buy tarp and nail it above every window in our row house. Mother and I stumbled through the house through those small dark rooms like feeble vampires, too brittle to hunt for human blood. Sandy was still gone. She simply vanished, as if she had drifted into some Bermuda triangle at the end of the block. 
It was possible that my addled neighbor had wandered nearly three miles to the outskirts of Wing down to the bottling plant the night she disappeared. No one really knew where she went on her daily walks. Had she somehow fallen prey to the melanin bottlers? I shuddered beneath my comforter, envisioning the gruesome brewing process. Did anyone really know how Fair Industries isolated the molecules that gave youth sap its anti-aging properties? The company had only been around for a few years. Maybe they kidnapped black women and girls, threw them into a giant vat in the basement of the factory, boiled their skins and extracted the pigment that way. It was a possibility. Wing was small, but I didn't know every black family that lived within those 44 blocks. Teen girls could vanish, assumed to be runaways. Single women could go missing, especially those considered not right in the head. Unaccounted for and unmourned. I toyed with my kitchen as I often did when I was nervous. Those gnarled strands at the nape of my neck were kinkier than usual. I didn't have the energy to comb my hair or wash it. Mother had woven my hair into two uneven French braids the day we went to the clinic. That was weeks ago, and I still hadn't untangled them. Now I played with that matted nape hair, ripping a few strands out completely as I thought back to the night of the explosion. Mother had come in the door, shaken and soot-laced, and I hugged her. Maybe the blast at the melanin factory had been radioactive. I mulled over the question that troubled me the entire sunless fall. Could melanin become toxic? Could some type of contamination occur during the separation process, one that was passed from dark woman to dark woman, from brown girl to brown girl, like a plague? Maybe the night of the conflagration, a batch churning with the weight of its tainted mission exploded and embers drifted up from the bowels of the factory up from the heat-shattered jars of sap and out into the night air, where the breeze carried them south to our side of town. Maybe Sandy was the supernova. My mother cried out in her sleep, making me jump. I felt a rush of love for her and a need to protect her, but I didn't know how. I thought I was on to something, but who would believe me? There was no one with whom I could share my theories, wild as they were. The police would just dismiss me as a lonely kid who watched too many scary movies. The coming days brought so many things to worry about. I worried about facing a life without sunshine. I worried about missing school. I still hadn't taken my SATs and didn't know when I would be well enough to finish studying. I worried about my wounded skin and my mother's frailty. During the day, when she should have been working at the mill, she told me stories of her childhood. This feels like rheumatic fever, Mom said as she sipped tea from the end of her couch, from her end of the couch. It was actually a concoction of boiled garlic, honey, and ginger to combat the flu, and the room was pungent with the vapors of her tonic. When Mother was seven, she had come home from school feeling lightheaded and collapsed at the bottom of the stairs. Her father had to carry her up to the bedroom. Doctors still made house calls back then, and the family physician, a gruff Irishman named McGregor, diagnosed her with rheumatic fever. For the next year, she lay in bed until the disease ran its course. Left me with a heart murmur, she said, staring at the gray canvas hanging from the window, blotting out the light. I felt hot tired all the time blisters like these rashes i fingered the nodules that lined my own arm and face planets of thickened skin a cosmos abandoned by mutinous sun do you think we're gonna die <laughs> did you think you were going to die i asked <sighs> mother blew into her teacup Nestled there in the blankets, her skin ashen and furrowed, she looked like a little old woman in a nursing home waiting for an attendant to wheel her to a brighter place. No, she said after a few moments. My mother prayed for me every day, at the foot of my bed, on her knees. She wouldn't let me die. 
and I won't let us die either. She said it with such authority that I believed her. Yet my body seemed beyond supplication. Little did I know, bleaker days were ahead. One morning in late October, I was jolted awake. Dawn crept beneath the tarpaulin at the window like a dark rose, spilling wilted petals on the floor. Something felt wrong, off, even more so than usual. The basement was blurry. A haze surrounded the coffee table and the television that I couldn't blink away. I wiped sleep from my eyes trying to focus, but that fuzzy outline remained. Mom! I cried, throwing off the blanket. I heard her shift wearily from her side of the couch. What's wrong, Anuma? She said in a small voice. I'm going blind. You ain't going blind, baby. Just sick. We both are. It'll pass. Mother's words did little to comfort me. Maybe they were more to comfort herself. There was no money for an eye doctor. She'd lost her part-time job at the phone company from missing so many days of work. Because she'd been employed at the textile mill for a dozen years, there was more security. But her sick leave was unpaid. There was no disability insurance for a prolonged fever that caused her skin, her skin to grow wrinkly. In the coming days, my vision waned and I lay in the blackness of the basement. I focused on sound. The stoic plink of water in the sink next to the washing machine. The cawing of birds perched on the telephone wire, taunting us with their fearlessness and their song. What struck me most was the absence of rhythm. A communal cadence of folks laughing on stoops and little girls skipping, skipping hopscotch. Their shoes thudding against the sidewalk as they leapt from chalky square to chalky square. If I focused on this sound with all my strength, could I convert it into light? Freshman year, I had watched Mr. Roth, my science teacher, perform an experiment with a transistor radio, a nine-volt battery, and a tiny roseate bulb, which was unlit. As he switched on the radio and the upbeat synth-tinged sounds of psychedelic furs filled the room, ghost in you, I think it was, he ran a cable from the radio to the wooden board contraption housing the tiny light bulb. A wavy... Ooh, sounded through the science lab as my classmates and I watched as the di diode flickered to life and gleamed with a fixed fuchsia brightness. Audio signals can be transmitted in radio waves through space and in electrical currents through wire, Mr. Roth explained with a satisfied smile. But not everything is as rosy as it seems, class. When one form of energy is transformed into another, some losses can occur. Melanin was a conductor not only of light, but of sound, or so it was thought. At least that's what the men who congregated on the steps of the Masonic Lodge down the street believed. I had passed that blue and white building on my way home from the bus stop many an afternoon, and sometimes heard the Masons discussing Africa and the superiority of dark skin, how we were like walking radios, more sensitive to various frequencies in the environment than our white counterparts. What if my skin, ruined and sunless, could absorb all the sounds around me, the plinking water calling birds, the garlicky snores of my mother, even the empty hum of a street scrubbed clean of music, to become a, a, a superconductor, much like Mr. Roth's science experiment, until my body vibrated with the force of those audio waves and emitted a glow strong enough to chase away the shadows in the basement, bright enough to rival the deceitful sun. I closed my eyes as firmly as I could and concentrated. I lay there, beneath my comforter squinting, tight, so tightly until my head trembled and my neck muscles bulged and my heart raced, swallowing sound. I tried to channel all the frequencies in my environment, every particle of noise, every little mote of melody, and slam them against the cement walls of the basement until they exploded to life like a galaxy on fire. My own private Big Bang. I focused until I got a headache. But no light emanated from behind my closed lids. Mother whimpered in her sleep. I opened my eyes. I often thought of Sandy. After Raymond finished his chores and cooked dinner each night, he shared the local gossip. Sandy still hadn't returned. 
A few weeks after she disappeared, someone tacked missing posters to the telephone poles on our street, and they still flapped there, unanswered. Other families in our neighborhood had nailed tarp to their windows as well. Most of the girls from our side of town were still absent from school. The men on the block speculated that some new outbreak of Legionnaire's disease had struck wing. It had been 40 years since the first epidemic rampaged a convention of white men celebrating the nation's bicentennial of Philly, in Philly, which was only six miles to the southeast. What in the world did the women and girls in my neighborhood have in common with the Legionnaires? I listened to my brother's stories, saying nothing, thinking of radioactive bottles of melanin, compact porcelain graves. Thanksgiving neared, ushering in a joyless season. Mother loved to cook, and during the holidays, our tiny row house bulged with the smell of collard green simmering on the back burner, sweet potato pie heavy with nutmeg and vanilla, and turkey brown to perfection. This Thanksgiving would be quiet. Mom was still bedridden, and Raymond only knew how to make soup and fish sticks. There would be no waves of feminine energy bouncing around the kitchen because my aunts and other women family members were housebound too. After months of being confined to the basement, I'd had enough of darkness and musty air. Mother and I were like jars of preserves rotting in a cobweb cellar, sealed away in a prison that leached our sweetness and toughened our skin. I needed air. A quick walk down the block. Anything. I hadn't been outside in so long, but I needed to do something to escape my blanket and those covered windows. I would go out at night when my brother came home. I felt safer with the moon, with the icy brilliance of stars. Against mother's protests, Raymond helped me up from the couch and led me upstairs, through the kitchen and living room and over to the front door. He held my wrist with one hand and opened the screen door with the other. As the cool night air rushed in, I braced myself against some, sing, some stinging sensation, some further assault on my skin. There was none. I took two or three steps across the threshold, holding the railing as I stood on our stoop. I got you, Anuma, my brother said, as I hesitated on the bottom step. His concern would have been touching a few months ago, even a little humorous. Now it just served to buttress my growing fear of incapacity. The street was as dark as the basement and just as blurry. I strained to make out the shapes of the bushes in our front yard or the row houses across the street, squat and uneven. Of the trees that dotted the block, the air smelled sweet, sweeter than I remembered. I lowered myself on the next step, on the step next to Raymond, listening to the night. As we sat in silence, I thought of the many nights Deidre and Lisa congregated on their stoops, blasting hip-hop from radios as I sat near the open window of my bedroom, listening to Bruce Springsteen and Billy Joel, alone. They thought I was corny. I thought they were brash. A ravine separated us, a dusty gorge of misunderstanding, now piled high with regret. Now that I yearned for community, there was no one around. I thought of Billy Joel and the Dying Factories in his song, Allentown, which was 20 minutes away. I thought of the restlessness that buckled the sidewalks of my small town, where a bright girl once left on a scholarship and returned a babbling shell. I thought of the girls who would never leave, and I was beginning to accept that I might be included in that company. Girls who would never know other sidewalks, other cultures, other songs a zoned life. They floated along the borders of wings like the cloudy water of the, I don't know how to pronounce this river, um, Shikil, Shilkil. <laughs> they floated along the borders of wing like the cloudy waters of the Shikil that lapped at its banks. The skulking river, aptly named by Dutch settlers, littered and forlorn. I thought of Bruce Springsteen and the hunger in his lyrics and his desire to dance in the darkness. Eventually, he and Billy Joel left their hometowns. They always could. As if sensing my sorrow, Raymond put his arm around me. The chilliness of the stoop pressed through my pajama bottoms. I was able to make out swaths of darkness in the windows of my neighbor's homes, 
a glassy blackness made even more prominent by the street light. Tarp. I closed my eyes as I leaned on my brother's shoulder. Come June, he would enlist in the army, as our father, uncle, and grandfather all did. Military men. Raymond worried about leaving mother and me in our condition, and I sensed the heaviness of that decision resting on his shoulders. We sat in silence, mulling over our respective burdens. His could be remedied. Mine could not. Into the stillness came the faint slap of feet on the pavement. I sensed a brightness outside my closed lids, like the return of a contrite sun. The hell? Raymond pulled away from me as he hurried to his feet. I opened my eyes, reaching for his arm. He helped me stand. She moved down the block, down a sidewalk that knew her footfalls better than her father ever could, trapping them in the stone like a wayward heartbeat. Sandy. She was no longer the wrecked track star, pacing up and down the streets of our town, wearing a raggedy fro and short shorts. Her movements were determined, sure. Her hair was gone. She was naked, shimmering, no, glowing. As if she had stood beneath the fiery geyser from the explosion at the melanin factory until she absorbed all the embers thick with a pigment both dreaded and beloved, until a sun pulsed beneath her stark skin, the very eye of heaven. I beheld her nakedness, marveling at her smooth head, the silky brown skin that gleamed with a dark luminosity, like a dying star whose light is barely discernible from earth, but with it, with which is, but which its own galaxy knows is both massive and divine. Where had she been? Why had she returned after being lost for so long? Had I inadvertently summoned her with my experiment in the basement, gathered her from the dust like a forlorn god craving companionship fashioned in her own image and song? Sandy headed toward her house in a sparkly shuffle, her newfound radiance competing with the street lamps. She was humming. She paused at the end of the walkway that connected our stoop to the sidewalk. Raymond grabbed my hand as if he feared some gravitational pull might yank me from the steps and over to her side. Sandy gazed at me as if seeing me for the first time. Her grin was wide and knowing. Come, she said. I shrugged off Raymond's hand and walked down the stoop. I didn't need my brother's help now. Even though the night was cool, the sidewalk felt warm beneath my bare feet as I headed toward Sandy. I didn't know if she was toxic, if my skin would bubble beneath her finger. But I did know that in a community of blistered, sun-broken women, I needed her phosphorescence. I stood in front, she stood in front of me, pulsing, a firefly loosed at last from a jar. I followed her up the street. And thus endeth the story. So that story was the eye of heaven. Um, that was by, hold on. That wasn't by Eden Royce. That was by Nicole D. Sconyers. Um, It was an interesting read. I have to say I was, I was fascinated by the premise overall. Um, for my tastes, I found that it left, too much unexplained and increasingly i think i think one of the one of the beautiful things but also one of the uh, possibly trying things about this format is we are exposed to so many different kinds of stories that come from so many different places creatively and i think we've had our fair share of stories that are kind of creative for creative sake um not that give us an array of beautiful dots, but don't connect the dots in a way that leave us with something. For me, that's how this story occurred. Lots of beautiful turns of phrase, lovely turns of phrase, a really uh, potent and interesting idea, some really interesting character building. We get this figure of Sandy, a woman with an interesting backstory, an interesting name. Um, but then a lot of questions, 
a lot of questions. Um, I see Latricia is, is asking one actually right now. Why weren't black men affected? I have no idea. I don't know. Um, again, though, some of the beautiful language here. Uh, black not only cracks, it blisters and hurts. Powerful, potent line. It sets us up for what we know is to come. Um, you know, there's there's not really any foreshadowing here so much as, you know, teaser trailers like we it's not even foreshadowing it's it's a little too blatant for that um but it doesn't it 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 doesn't quite give us what we're looking for um i'm looking at the comments and it looks like some of you all were having buffering issues over on uh youtube which is really really unfortunate so i'm really sorry you guys are having uh connection issues i'm i'm glad that some of you all came back to uh to facebook um that really sucks but anyway we're hopefully uh the recording of it was fine if not it's all good every time i stream i record every episode so i can reload it to youtube and maybe that'll give me a chance to reload it with the proper episode number um skew kill emo tells me is the correct pronunciation of that Pennsylvania river. Thank you so much. Tall spirit Morris enjoyed the story and I'm glad I'm glad. Like I said, there's a lot to enjoy. There were just certain things that were a little, um, interesting, uh, interesting, but not necessarily fulfilling for me. Um, Again, this was another one of those lines where it's kind of like, why did we go there? Bulging with smells didn't quite sound right. Um, communicated the idea in a really interesting way didn't quite sound like what we were what what just fell okay that was my phone didn't quite sound like you know that's not the way that we tend to think of smell um and and so it were there were certain turns of phrases like that that for me felt a little bit there's an expression that we learn in uh journalism journalistic writing kill your darlings Every time you write something that feels a little bit too good, a little bit too clever, a little cute, even it probably needs to go. It's probably that little bit of extra, that flash that if you do a quick turn in the mirror that you should take off the outfit. Some of the lines in this occurred for me that way. And again, it did. It left me with so many questions. Latricia says the future doesn't offer better health care. Got to get rid of this capitalism bullshit. Not sure exactly what that's in context to. But yes, agreed wholeheartedly. One hundred percent. Benyel loves the story and that's cool. That's good. Like I said, I, I actually, I want to hear that. I want to see the comments from if you guys disagree with me. Um, if it, if it, if it hits you in the mouth differently and you absolutely love it, tell me about it. Um, I want to know, I want to hear. Um, but again, if you enjoy these books, they are these stories that are coming out of this wonderful book, black from the future, a collection of speculative black writer writing, you can find it at our friends over at Harriet's bookshop. The link is right here. And since a lot of you are on Facebook, you could just go ahead and click that link right there in the chat. If you're still watching us on YouTube or on another one of the platforms, you can go ahead and, um, uh, look it up, just, you know, plop it into your address bar and you'll be able to find it. Go to bookshop.org forward slash books. And then uh, just, you know, you, you can read it. I don't need to call it out for you. Um, okay. Um, this is a little bit sudden. I have absolutely enjoyed the night, but um, I am, I am heeding a call uh, from the next room and uh, as much as I love this, that comes first. So you guys, we're going to have to cut the broadcast a little bit early. My apologies. Love you much. Um, this has been Storytime with Julian. Take care. Peace.